We're expecting God to be God in our midst today. Come on, stand up to your feet. Let's worship and praise the name that's above every name today. The one who is our healer. you, Lord, try to get you to do something that you've already done. 
God, I'm so grateful today that you are the great physician. You are the healer. You're the name above every other name. And we honor you in this place today, Lord God, and give you all thanks and all glory in Jesus' name.
over the fact that he shook the ground of their religion and their traditions. You guys, over probably a hundred men spat in his face. And not only did they spit in his face, but they also punched him in the face as hard as they could, one by one. Over a hundred men, one by one, after another, after another, after another. And it said they, the translation, they spat so hard in his face that they actually came up to him probably about this close to his face and spat as hard as they could to the point where it was dripping from his hair, from his eyes, from his nose, from his, it was everywhere. Could you imagine somebody hating you so much that you, that because you shook up your, their traditions, and that God is thinking about today's society and we get so busy and this song is so prevalent for today because we're looking so much for places, for time, just to make room for Him. When He made room for us there in the beginning, when people were so used to their ways and so used to their making money, using people, doing what was common ground for them, doing what they were told to do. They listened and they liked their life because it was what was good for them and it was tradition. And they didn't have to worry about change. They didn't have to worry about, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, coming to them and saying, go pray for that person because they were so stuck in their tradition and in their ways. I thank God that he made room for me. And even what I'm hearing in my heart is even if it's the most despicable thing that your brother, your sister, your mom, your father, your husband, your wife, your grandkids, your friends, your boss, no matter how bad you think it is, make room and let it go. Cast your cares upon what he did for you way back when. 
and get that image in your head of that moment when he proclaimed who he was for them by his father making room for them. And they had an ungrateful and thankful heart because he was shaking up their traditions and their religion. Let them shake it up. Say, God, shake it up. Shake it up. Come on. Say, God, shake it up. Shake it up. Shake it up. And right now, I thank you, Father. We lay all of our burdens down at your feet in Jesus' name. We thank you that you took care of it way back when. And right now, we proclaim that we walk in forgiveness with a thankful heart and a grateful heart and cast those burdens upon you because you care for us. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. Worthy is your name. 
centered on you, thinking on those things that are worthy of praise, those things that are of a good report. God, you're worthy. The Lamb is worthy. <laughs> the Lamb is worthy. The Lamb who was slain for us is worthy of all of our praise. All of our worship. Bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. Oh, my soul and all that is within me. Wow, so good to just take a few minutes this afternoon. Wherever you're joining us from around the world today, we want to say he is worthy. Amen. Every minute of every day, he's worthy. Not just in a healing school or maybe in a weekend service this weekend, but you know, he's worthy tonight. He's worthy tomorrow morning. He's worthy in the middle of the storm. He's worthy in the middle of that battle. Whatever it is that's been trying to come against you, the one who's greater, 
the one who's in you is worthy. Come on, can we just slip up our hands one more time and just bless his name? Just tell him thank you today that he paid the price that was unaffordable to anybody else. The price that nobody else could pay but Jesus. The sinless Lamb of God who laid down his life and calls you friend. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we bless you. We thank you that you're for us. <laughs> you're not against us. You are our healer. You're not the one who makes us sick. God, you're the one who has made us well. And we celebrate you in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, and in this place today and around the world. And all of God's people said a big amen and amen. Woo, so good to worship with you today. Why don't you give somebody a hug that you didn't come with today? Tell somebody God's for them. And we're going to break away to a video and we'll be right back here with some good news today. I was diagnosed with diabetes shortly after I think Hannah was healed. We just moved to a new house, went to a new patient checkout with the, with the, with the local practitioner there because you, it's the kind of thing you have to do in England. And um, did some, they did some their regular tests, height and weight and all that kind of thing. And then they came back and they said to me, you've got diabetes. So I said to them, no, I haven't got diabetes. And we had a bit of an argument about it. And then they said, well, you have to go for a fasting glucose test, which means you starve yourself for 24 hours. And then they go and they, they test your blood sugar all over again. And so they did the, they did the test and the, the results came back and it said that um, I had diabetes. So they said, you know, this is, these are the test results. I said, I, I don't have diabetes, I'm sorry. And uh, so they said, well, what do you want us to do? I said, well, you can do the test again if you like. So they did the test again, and the test came back, and the test said I had diabetes, and I said I don't have diabetes. And this went round and round for about three times, and after the third round of reports came back and said I had diabetes, I just got mad. I'm like, I don't have diabetes. At that point, I don't know whether, whether honestly, I knew very much about faith. I was just determined I wasn't going to collect another disease. So I was like, I don't care, honestly, what your report says. You can keep it. I've got a different report. And I'm going to go by what I know, and I'm not going to have diabetes. And the doctor got really mad at that point, and he sat me down in the chair, and he said, look, you're a very sick young lady, and if you are my daughter, or you are my wife, or you are my sister or my mother, I would be very concerned about you. I said, I appreciate your concern, but I really can't help you anymore with this because I have a different report. And I, and I walked out. And, um, and he said, well, you know, you, you could, I can't care for you then. So we parted ways amicably, but I never had diabetes. I never had any symptoms of diabetes. I just refused to believe in the, in the negative report. And I think sometimes there comes a place where our first response to bad news is critical. We need to establish ourselves in the Word of God to the point where when bad news comes our way, we're not moved by it. You know, our, the first report is God's report. Amen? And that's the one I'm sticking by. And that's been nine. Hallelujah! How are you doing? You excited? Well, welcome to Healing School. You know what? It has been such a amazing day today. That's what I'm going to say. You know why I'm going to say that? Because I'm not going to give the enemy any place for all the stuff that took place today. Because he was trying to change my attitude, change the atmosphere, and this is what I did. Because he's not in control. So I am so glad that you're joining us here for Healing School. I'm excited that you are here. Those of you that are watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. I know that you watch us every week. I know there are faithful people. They're constantly sending me emails and texts and stuff, not texts, but emails and stuff on the platforms that they're watching from that they are just being healed by watching us online. If you did not know that, how many of you, this is your first time at Healing School. You've never been here before. Well, welcome. So glad. So glad. Well, you know, when you're not here, there is so many different platforms you can watch us on. So what we have, we have YouTube, we have Facebook, 
We also have gospeltruth.tv. That's probably going to be your best, and my sister over there is saying yes. Yes, that's probably going to be your best watching experience. But you know what? As you're watching on those different platforms, we have people that are on staff that they're communicating with you. And when you're saying that you're from Zimbabwe, and I mean, because we've got people watching from all over England, no matter where you're at, you can watch us and you don't even have to watch us live. You can go to the archives because we had many, many years of healing school. Was anybody here last week for campus days? Good, good, yes. We can always applaud. We can always applaud. So glad that you were here with us last week. Last week was our birthday. We had a birthday party, so we had some cupcakes. So we are 11 years old now. So when I say for you to go to the archives, we don't have it from, I don't think we don't have uh, videos from 2011 when we start, but we do have a lot of archives. Let me just encourage you to take this challenge. I challenge you to go back to healing school and to watch all, even whatever's on AWMI, CarisBibleCollege.org, go there. I challenge you to watch those healing schools for each week, whatever you're faced with, watch them and see if you stay sick. I'm just saying, take the challenge, take the challenge. If there's something that's attacking your body, I challenge you, go back and watch each day how many years could you possibly watch of constantly getting downloads of healing scripture and teaching and stuff like that? And your spirit and your body is going to be like, wait a minute, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it's going to begin to speak. And when you get that word, I'm telling you, it's going to do something for you. So we are so glad that you're here. At the end of our service today, we are actually going to have prayer ministers that are going to come on. They're going to come up here and they're going to be willing to agree with you in prayer. Also, those of you that are watching online, we have prayer ministers that are on site. They're, some are on site, some are like in remote, or not remote, but different locations, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if it is a Sunday and it is Midnight, and you think nobody can possibly be there to take my call. I need somebody to agree with me in prayer. You dial 719-635-1111, 719-635-1111, and somebody will be there to agree with you in prayer. Amen? So we have a few announcements. One thing that I want to say to you, I'm glad, you know, those of you that are here. I had one uh, visitor. She said to me that she was here from Texas. I don't even see my sister here, but she said she was visiting from Texas. I want to encourage you, as you're coming in from different locations, please, that number I just gave you, I need you to call them. I need you to check our websites before you actually come on site. Right now, we're going to give, I'm going to talk about some testimonies. You know what? We had... Some of you raised your hand and you said that you were here for campus days last week. We had so, oh my gosh, so many testimonies, not just for the entire conference, but also for healing school during the conference. We had salvations, we had baptisms in the Holy Spirit, spirits, and the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongue. Oh my gosh. I mean, people, teeth were healed, healing and brokenheartedness, brain fog. I'm t you know what? It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Forgiveness. Sometimes, you know what? You, th you think it has to be cancer, AIDS, diabetes, high blood pressure, something like that. It's, it's not just that. It's some brokenheartedness stuff that's going on. It's real. And you know what? God cares about that. So it doesn't matter what it is. There's nothing too big and there's nothing too small. If it's concerning you and it's attacking your body, he doesn't want it. You know why? Because he took it already on the cross. He took it on the cross already. Why are you, you don't even have to deal with it. It's actually, it's an intruder that's invading your space. And if your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And Andrew always says he's one third, he's wall to wall Holy Ghost. So if the Holy Ghost is in there and Jesus died for you and he already took it on the cross, there's no room for anything else. No sickness, no pain, or anything that's trying to attack your body. You don't have room for that. Amen? 
So we had so many healings that have taken place. There was one testimony um, that I wanted to share with you. Last week when I was up here, what I said was a young lady, she was actually... Um, she was watching online, and she was talking about, she, I said to her, I said to her, no, I think she was actually here, and she said that I said, expect big. Expect big, ask big. Is there something you're believing God for? It doesn't matter if it's financial or I need a house, I want my kids to come back home, I got a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, you know what, my daughter's on, she's an addict or something like that. It doesn't matter about any of that. So I said, ask big. So she said right there in that moment, that's what she did. She was like, she said, ax big. I'm axing big. She said it was a wart on her face. So that's something visible you could see, right? And so she said, you know what? I'm axing big. And she, she cursed it. I said, you have to speak to that thing. So she cursed it, and it was still there. She went about the day. She went home and everything. And she said that she was looking at it, and she was still saying, you had no place there. How dare you be on my face? And she's speaking to it and everything. And she just did like this to touch it. Guess what? It fell off. It fell off. It fell off. Well, you know what? Just like that warped, anything Anything that's attacking your body does not need to be there. At this time, you know what? I think last week also I gave away Healing Journeys, Volume 7. We have so many healing journeys happening. But you know what? Some of you, you said this is your first time here. Maybe somebody's watching online and they're thinking, well, Tracy's talking about this Healing Journeys thing. What is that all about? So what we're going to do is we're going to show a video. And in that video, Daniel is going to show us how to navigate to get to that on the website. Hi there, my name is Daniel Amstutz and I'm the director of the Karis Bible College School of Worship as well as the School of Healing. And today I want to show you how to access the Healing Journeys video library. We've got some amazing stories of people who have received their healings that Jesus provided over 2,000 years ago. Everything from emotional and mental and physical healings of every kind you could imagine. But you're going to get to see them and their journey of how they received what Jesus has already provided. It's going to encourage your heart. Begin by going to awmi.net. Scroll down and click the watch graphic. Once the page loads, scroll down and click the Healing Journeys panel. You will see that you can begin watching our featured Healing Journey, or you can scroll through the panel on the right to see our collection of Healing Journey videos. We encourage you to do this because the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And this is going to be so strengthening to your faith and encouraging to you. You are going to be so blessed and we hope that it will absolutely inspire you to live life abundantly. Amen. Sometimes people, you... You, they don't want to hear the words you're going to say to them out of the scripture if you're trying to give them chapter and verse. But if you just tell them, you know what, just, just go to this website. You know, this person, they, they have a similar situation that you're walking through or they have the same exact situation that you're walking through. Just listen to what they have to say. And that encourages them and that stirs up something in them. Amen? You're really quiet, but that's okay because I'm loud enough for everybody. But guess what we're going to do right now? We're going to give away some presents. We're going to give away some gifts because I like giving away things. <laughs> and, hey, I'm, you know what? My husband and I actually, we are givers, and we like to give things to people, not just money and stuff like that, giving people words of knowledge, giving them words of wisdom, giving them a word from the Lord, but also just giving things like this because sometimes people just, no, need to know that you care. And when, sometimes when you give them a product and after you've read it or something you know about it, this right here, what I'm going to give away, this is the first thing I'm going to give away, and it's called God's Airways, a practical guide to tuning in to God's voice through modern day prophecy. This is actually a book by some 
classmates of mine, Brian and Sue Nutman. And uh, yes, so if any of you know them, any of our first time guests here, any first time guests that would like this? First time guests? Amen. Pastor Greg actually spoke last week for the conference, but he has a, a book, I believe this is his newest book, it's called Walking in Wisdom, How to Access the Mind of Christ and Make Good Decisions. How many of all we know we need some help making decisions because sometimes we can't do it by ourselves, so why not have the Holy Spirit, right? So any of my first time guests, Ms. Kay is going to give that to you. All right. Did you enjoy worship? Was worship not was worship not amazing? Oh my gosh. And and they sang my song. I was running around doing a couple of things. So I was missing my song, Make Room for Me. I love that song. But you know what? Healing is here. Anybody know healing is here? Yes. Healing is here. Healing is now. Why not today? Why not today? Is there anybody expecting something today? You're expecting something, you're expecting a healing, you're expecting an answer today. Well, I guarantee you Pastor Jeremy is in the house and he's got a word for you. He's got a word for you this afternoon. This CD is Healing is Here and it's so powerful because on here, in between the songs, we have have Andrew, we have Daniel that is actually reading scripture and it's so powerful. Even if you know somebody that's going through something and you want to just play this for them, Miss Jamie Walmack is on here, Um, R.W. Schombach is on here, also um, Elizabeth Murin, Andrew Walmack. So you got to buy the CD. you got to buy the CD. My brother Thomas is going to give that away. One of my first-time guests. And this is from Miss Audrey Mack. I wanted to give this away. It's a USB, and it's, the t- title of it is Healing. You don't have to stay sick as a dog. I just thought that was great. So it's a USB of, teaching, of a teaching on healing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I do have something else I'm going to give away, but I'm getting ready right now. We're getting ready to receive the offering, and I just feel led that the Lord is saying, wait on that until I give the offering. There's a reason why I'm going to do that. My ushers right now, they're going to pass out the offering envelopes to you. They will probably have pens as well if you need a pen to write out your offering envelope. So they're going to pass it down every aisle. So if you could just take the offering envelopes, if you need a pen, just let them know that you need a pen. If you're writing out a check, please make the check payable to Karis Bible College or CBC. If you have, there's a place there for you to write out your information for credit card giving or debit card giving. We just encourage you to only do that as a way of convenience of giving for yourself. So please print legibly so that the accounting department can read it and we don't have to do an interpretation before we take the, you know, get all the information in. (laughs) So if you could do that, we'd be so happy. Those of you that are watching online and you want to be a part of our giving today, you can do that as well. If you would kindly go to awmi.net forward slash healing, that is gonna take you to our healing center page and you scroll to the center of that page, you should be able to watch us live there as well, but right below that screen, you will see an orange donate button. Please click that and it will take you to another page and you can prayerfully consider partnering with us. Somebody, I don't know who it was, but they told me partners catch more fish. So I'm just saying, you can, you can prayerfully consider partnering with us. We would greatly appreciate that. If you want to text to give, you can text the word give to 844-887-0796. Again, text the word GIVE to 844-887-0796. Because I know some people, that's how they like to give as well. You know, as I was thinking about the offering and the reason I was holding on to this book, as you're filling out your information, 
A few years ago, one of our interns, this was when we actually were going out of the country to do missions trips and stuff like that. So one of the interns that I had, she said that she, was, she wanted to share. And so she was sharing with me about while she was on her missions trip, she was in Costa Rica, and she said that they were in the marketplace. So while they were there in the marketplace, she said that they had this sign, and the sign said, free hugs. So they just held the sign up as people were walking by, you know, free hugs. And then it was this one woman that walked past them, you know, it was her because they would kind of paired them off. So her and the person she was paired with, they saw this woman walk by, she just broke into tears. And so she, they were like, well, why is she crying? So, I mean, you're seeing a sign that says free hugs and then somebody walks by and starts crying. So they went over there and they said, can we pray for you? And she said, yes, you could pray for me. And she said that, um, would you pray for me because the government took my children and I want them back? And so my intern at the time, she said, you know, we're in Costa Rica and we're just looking. She said, we've seen all these different people. They're seeing a lot of homeless people. And she said that as they're seeing these people, you know what, they're, they're not asking for, like, you would think, can I have some food? Can I have some money? Can you pray for a shelter for me? Most of them were praying about their children and that their children were lost, or that they didn't have them anymore. Does anybody have a child that's lost? Or someone that you love that's lost, right? Well, we're God's children as well. So, you know, when I was thinking about all of this, we're, we're God's children, and we have a mission field. No matter where you're living at, those of you that came here and you said that you're guests, no matter where you live at, I'm telling you, there's a mission field for you to, to tap into, to minister to somebody. Because everybody doesn't know about the Jesus we know. Everybody doesn't know that God wants you well. Everybody doesn't know that he loves them and he loves them unconditionally. So when she was thinking of, when she was doing this and she was thinking about the children, I chose this when I was reading this again. I was like, you know what? We're God's children, and there are lots of people out there on the in the mission field. Walmart, as you're in McDonald's, Safeway, Whole Foods, it doesn't matter where you are. There is somebody there. I know that Daniel and Tracy, sometimes when they're in different stores and stuff like that, the Lord may lead them, and they pray for people. And some, most of the time, when you ask somebody, you see something wrong, especially if you see somebody and you see them walking like this, that's visible. But if you're so tuned in and you're listening to the Holy Spirit, he can say something to you too about, ask this question. We need to be willing and obedient to do what God is calling us to do. What does this have to do with offering? Because when you give today, you're helping us here at Karis Bible College and AWM God's got a whole bunch of children, just like this one woman that said the government took her kids. There are a whole bunch of children out there that do not know about Papa God. They don't know about their Abba Father. They don't know anything about that. Well, when you give today, you're helping us to reach those children. So I want you to just think about that. Think about the person that you raised your hand for and you said you had a loved one that was lost. Think about the person that it might not be you, and I saw you, sis, raise your hand. It might not be you, but when you sow today, it might take somebody else that had a part of this Caris Bible College healing school that they go somewhere and they see your loved one and you don't even know about it. You won't even know about it till you get on the other side. But that person was allowed to do that because you gave today. So when we look at Luke 15, verses 23 and 24, it says, And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. And they began to be merry. We want to be merry for all those children that are lost. And at this time, we're going to have, um, I'm gonna pray for the offering, and we're gonna receive that offering. And um, right after that, um, my uh, Miss Kay, what she's gonna do for me, is this is this book I wanted to give out. It said, the, 20, the 21 toughest questions your kids will ask 
that, that they will ask about Christianity and how to answer them confidently. So this is why I say this, because I'm talking about children and God's children. But you know what? Some people might have some kids. Okay, you know what? What is my kid asking about Christianity? So once we receive the offering, Miss Kay is going to give this to whoever the Lord is leading her to that is a first-time guest. So let us pray. Amen? Father, we thank you. We thank you for these, your precious sheep, God. We thank you, Lord God, that we are purposing in our hearts to give this afternoon, oh God. I thank you, Lord God, that as we're giving, we have our loved one in mind that is a lost child, God. And we know that it's about you having a relationship with them. You want to have a relationship with them. And we're giving today because we know that this is good ground. And there's so many others that do not know you. So I thank you as they give today, oh God, that nothing will be lost, nothing will be lacking in any household that gives today, that they will receive a harvest in this life, a hundredfold return in Jesus' name, amen. And at this time, it is my, we'll receive the offering. At this time, it is my pleasure and my honor to bring to the stage the Director of Healing School, Daniel Amstetz. Thank you, Tracy. Tracy is such a blessing. Sure, appreciate her and all of our team. And uh, I'm just so excited to have Jeremy Pearsons with us today. Jeremy, thank you for making time in your busy schedule uh, to come today. For those of you who do not know, uh, Jeremy pastors Legacy Church in Green Mountain Falls. And he also, with his wife, founded Legacy Television. And they have Pearsons Ministries International. So you can go to the website, or the internet rather, and check out their website. But uh, Jeremy teaches here a lot and has spoken at several of our conferences and has been um, one of our speakers here for the healing school uh, several times. And so I love being able to get them back. His wife, Sarah, is also a worship leader, and she's got some wonderful worship uh, product available on their website. So if you haven't ever uh, heard her uh, musical gift. Uh, it definitely is a blessing. So again, let's give a big warm welcome, a healing school welcome to Jeremy Pearsons as he comes to minister the word to us today. Amen. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, sir. Great seeing you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Good to see everybody this afternoon. Are you happy today? Glory to God. I see you've all social distanced yourselves, so thanks for that. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. It's all been canceled. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I think we knew that before anybody else knew it, that it had been canceled. Oh, thank you, Lord. You're happy about the Word of God this, this afternoon. Oh, where would we be without the Word of God? I mean, we'd be trying to make our own foundation something firm to stand on, and you see people do it every day trying to find a firm place for their feet to stand. But I just thank God. You and I have got his word. We can stand on his word. We can take his word as truth, not a truth, not my truth, the truth. His word is the truth. And when you hear it as the truth and you receive it as the truth, it puts foundation underneath your feet. And I'm watching people all over the world right now. And my thought is, man, they need some foundation repair. Right. You, you know anything about foundation repair? I think home builders and, and people in construction can tell you, man, if there's something wrong with the foundation, you better believe there's something wrong with everything above it. You got to get the foundation right. So today in our time, as we turn our attention towards what the word says about healing, specifically about healing, we are going to let the word of God put foundation underneath our feet. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word. Your word is truth. We believe it. We receive it today. We honor you and we honor your word. We honor your word as the highest authority. We give you place above the word of any doctor, above the word of any lawyer, above the word of any family member or close friend. You get the highest place. Your word is first word. Your word is last word. Your word is every word in between. We honor it. We reverence it today. And we allow your spirit to go to work in us, to do in us what only you can do. And we give you praise, we give you glory and honor for the good work you've begun in us. We call you faithful to finish it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 If you've got your Bible with you this afternoon, I want you to open, please, to the book of John. John chapter 5. 
This is a familiar passage to you if you're familiar at all with the the ministry of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. And we read in John chapter 5 about a man who had been lame. The Bible tells us he was lame in his legs for 38 years. That's a long time. Is that that not right? That's a long time. 38 years to be dealing with this infirmity. And we've got to learn to see this the way the Lord sees it. You know, the Bible says in the book of Acts that Jesus went about doing what? Good. Good. It's about to tell you what good is. But you know this, he went about doing good, healing. So right there, you know, healing is a good thing. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That tells you something else about sickness. It is not from God. It is not, you hear me getting louder? That's on purpose. It is not a blessing in disguise or otherwise. It is satanic oppression. And the believer ought not have any of it in their life. Because Jesus, who was good then, is good now, and he is still, still a healing Jesus. Right. He went about doing good, healing all who had been oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And one of the things you and I have to understand about what Jesus was equipped with as he ministered in this earth. He was equipped with the anointing. Somebody say the anointing. The anointing. What is the anointing? You see this in the book of Isaiah in various places, but the anointing is the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God. And that's why Jesus stood up in Luke chapter 4 and said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. To do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. That tells you that poverty is a burden and a yoke and the anointing was and is on Jesus to remove that burden and destroy that yoke. He said, the spirit of the Lord's on me because he's anointed me too. And what was the very next thing he said? First he said, preach. And the next thing he said was what? Heal the brokenhearted. That tells you and me that the broken heart is a burden and a yoke that was and is lifted and destroyed by the anointing that was on Jesus, that is on Jesus. Now, it'd be hard to find anybody in the body of Christ that would disagree with you when you said Jesus was anointed. They'd say, well, of course he was, yes. And then you said, well, he is anointed. Yes, he is. He's the Christ. That means anointed one, his anointing. Here's where you lose a bunch of people, though. You ready? When you stand up and say, I got the same stuff on me. I've been anointed with a measure of the same anointing that was and is on Jesus. Oh, and then that religious, traditional spirit just, I don't know about that. uh, Jesus, yes, you. No, no, I know you. (laughs) Deal with it. Deal with it. The Bible tells us we have a measure of that same anointing. Glory to God. And I say all that to, to, to highlight this. Here's a man we're reading about who's been blessed for the last 38 years. No, this is a burden. This is a yoke. And unless something comes along to remove that burden and destroy that yoke, he's going to live with it every day for the next 38 years. So here's a man who's been laid, and, and you know the story, laid at the pool of Bethesda waiting for the angel to come stir the waters because when the water stirred if you can be the first one in you can be healed you know this account but Jesus comes along in uh, verse 6 of John chapter 5 says when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already that he uh, already had been in that condition a long time he said to him listen to this question do you want To be made well. Jesus, asking this man, who the Bible says Jesus knew he'd been in that condition a long time. And Jesus looks at him and says, do you want to be made well? Now, Jesus was notorious for this on more than one occasion. Asking people questions when the answer was so, or should have been, so obvious. 
Do you want to be made well? Somebody help me out, church. What is the obvious answer to this question? Yes, yes and yes, please. But I'm reminded of another time that Jesus was walking along the road. And there was a man sitting on the side of the road who the Bible called Blind Bartimaeus. And he heard that Jesus was nearby. And what did Bartimaeus, Blind Bartimaeus, start doing? Crying out, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And what did he do? He cried the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus called him there. And all the people who were saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. Now they're saying, hey, come here, come here. Jesus wants to, he wants to see you. And Bartimaeus, they, I don't know if he's just kind of feeling his way around or what, but they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus looks at this man. Do you know what Jesus said to him? What do you want me to do for you? If I'm Bartimaeus, I'm like, and they call me blind. What do you think I, I want you to do? But let me ask you, is there ever even one wasted word out of the mouth of Jesus? Not one. So this question he put to this lame man laying at this pool, do you want to be made well? What he said to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? We may think the answers are obvious, but if you read on here in John chapter 5, this is interesting to me. Verse 7 should actually probably be the shortest verse in the Bible, and yet it's not. Verse 7 should be a one-word verse. If verse 6 ends, do you want to be made well? What should all of verse 7 say? Yes. Yeah. Period. Notice this though, verse 7. The sick man answered and said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. I want to get into some things in the word for a few minutes today, but this is what I believe the Lord wants us to ask and answer before we go any further. Do you want to be made well? Whether you're dealing with something right now, presently, physically in your body, whether you ever have or, or whatever comes your way, you need to be able to answer this question out of the mouth of Jesus. Do you want to be made well? Especially if there's any among us who have dealt with something, you might call something like this chronic. Am I right? Something that is persistent has been in your life and a part of your life. Here's a man that's had it for nearly four decades. He's not the only one in Scripture. There was a man uh, in the book of Acts who they said had been laid daily at the gate called Beautiful. Right. Daily. Everybody say daily. daily. And what you find out about him, if you keep reading, is that he's been this way from his mother's womb, yep. and he's over 40 years old. That's right. So I don't know at what point they started laying him at that gate, but I guarantee you this... It's been years, years of his life, if not decades. And when you have something that's tried to attach itself to you, especially something that's been a part of your life for so long, and somebody like Jesus comes along, or even some man or woman of God standing on a platform like this and says to you, do you want to be made well? It seems like the answer would be obvious. And yet, if people were to find out what really has to happen in many cases to be made well, I'm not sure the answer would always be yes. Case in point. Man, do you want to be made well? What's he start doing? Instead of just yes, starts blaming. I don't have anybody. Now, if you read this whole account, I think it's nothing but a picture of the grace and the mercy and the compassion of the Lord. And we have to be watchful sometimes as faith people, people of faith, people who know what grace has provided and how faith lays a hold of it and receives it. We have such a tendency sometimes to, to focus so much on one thing that we look at others or, or even ourselves and say, well, you know, if you're not saying this right and, and you're not crossing all the faith T's and dotting all the faith I's, and I think there is an I and a T in faith, but you understand what I mean. If you're not getting it mechanically right, then you're not going to receive. 
And we do have to acknowledge that many, actually most, the overwhelming majority of healing miracles in the ministry of Jesus, his response to that person was, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole over and over and over again. And of course, we know he did it, but without a faith response to him, it wouldn't happen. And yet you got this. You would have to look hard to find any faith in this guy. (laughs) And yet Jesus says to him, rise, take up your mat and walk. I suppose you could say faith came in when the guy actually did what Jesus told him to do. There's faith right there. I guess what I'm trying to draw your attention to here is let's not be so dogmatic. Let's not be so restrictive sometimes on how the Lord does things in our lives. And who he does what for. Let's be open to him. And if he says to you or to me or to any of us, do you want to be made well? Let's find out why he's asking the question. When people find out that to be made well, you are going to have to lose the identity of a sick person. A lot of times they don't want to do it. Have you noticed this? When somebody's got something in their lives that has been that way for so long, it becomes a part of their identity. That sickness, that disease, that debilitating factor in their life, we've seen it over and over. Whether they realize it or not, for many people, it becomes part of the identity. You hear it in the way they talk. My bad knee my bad eye. They joke about, oh, I'm getting older. First thing that goes to memory. <laughs> I can't see like I used to. Can't hear like I used to. Oh, I can't eat that. Why? Because of my condition. Because I'm allergic to that. Because I have a sensitivity to that. Can you hear what comes out of people's mouths all the time? Their identity with that sickness. And connected to your identity with it, and this is what you really got to be watchful over, is that you don't allow yourself to ever use that sickness to your advantage. What do I mean by that? People find out that because of what I suffer with, because of what I'm sick with, I can get this benefit from this person or get this benefit from this government program or I can get this help from these people If you tell people, do you want to be made well? Yeah, okay. Well, you're going to have to stop using that sickness. But listen to me, church. You will never lose what you use. You'll never lose it. As long as you're dependent on it, as long as it's part of the identity, as long as it's coming out of your mouth all the time, your identity with that thing, that thing's identity with you, you become one, you become inseparable from it. Never lose it. Do you want to be made well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, you're going to have to stop using that thing. You're going to have to stop identifying as that. You're going to have to stop identifying, I'm diabetic. I'm fill in the blank. Huh? It's going to have to stop being your identity. Do you want to be made well? What's the obvious answer? Shout it out for me. Yes. Yes, I want to be made well. And especially if it's been something in your life for a long time. But we're going to have to stop doing what this guy did. Well, it's this. If I I could be if I had somebody else or if somebody else would do this for me. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I want to be made well. So I want this to be what goes around in your heart today as we just dig a little deeper into the Word of God and what the Word says about our healing. I want you to be ready and willing if you've identified as the sick. I want that to change today. Your identity is no longer the sick. Your identity is the healed of the Lord. That's who you are and that's what you are. So that has to change. So at, let me ask you one more time. Do you want to be made well? Yes. What's the answer? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, look with me, please, uh, here in the New Testament, back in the book of Matthew, 
chapter 21. This is something we were talking about recently in our church. Uh, actually, just this past weekend, um, a lot of people are celebrating uh, the, what many call the Holy Week and then starting with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. You ever read anything about that, heard anything about it? I like that, man. I like reading about this, that, that, that triumphal entry where he's coming in and it's loud and people are praising and worshiping and they're, they've got palm branches on the road and many have taken off their coats and jackets and laid it for him to, to, to come into the city. And it's, it's an awesome thing to read about. But something hit me as I was getting ready for this in our own church this past weekend. And as wonderful it is as it is to read about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Is there anybody else excited about Jesus' triumphal re-entry? We got to get excited about that one because he's coming back. Jesus is coming back. Would you say it out loud with me? Jesus is coming back. My king is coming and it's going to be a triumphal re-entry. Sometimes you hear about these uh, NASA programs and spaceships that take off and they, they orbit around the earth and they get outside the earth's atmosphere, but uh, something's going to have to happen, right? These guys got to come home. They have to re-enter. There's got to be a re-entry. And that's what I want to start up about today. Not just how he came into Jerusalem that day. I know we're celebrating it now, but what about him coming back? The reason I bring this up is because I think... That what we read about his entry into Jerusalem, it's going to look much the same. It's going to sound a, a very similar. The, the way it did that day as he came riding into town, it's going to look and sound a lot like that as he comes back to town. And you remember this whole story, don't you? I mean, it started with Jesus saying to two of his disciples, look, go to the town opposite you. You remember this? He said, when you get there, there's a donkey tied up. And we were laughing about this uh, at church on Sunday. He said, there's a donkey tied up that has never been ridden. <laughs> Evidently, Jesus was not in the market for a used donkey <laughs> or a donkey with a bunch of miles on it. Man, Jesus wanted that new donkey smell. He said, there's one tied up over there, never been ridden. <laughs> that made some stupid cheesy joke. If you put a saddle on it, it's got leather interior, but we don't uh, forget it. Um, but he said it happened just the way he said it did. He said it would. So they go over to, uh, across town and they start to untie the donkey. And Jesus said, listen, if anybody tells you or asks you what you're doing, you just say the master has need of it. Sure enough, they start to untie the donkey. Somebody says, what are you doing? They said, the master has need of it. And they said, okay. <laughs> like, hey, that worked. And so they brought it to Jesus. And of course, you know the rest of that. He comes riding in. But the Bible says in verse 5, Matthew 21, verse 5, all, that, all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Verse 5, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. I'm telling you, church, the same thing this afternoon. Your king is coming to you. It says, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, you know, the disciples did everything that, they, that he had told them to do. Verse 9 says, Then the multitudes, as he was coming into town, who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Skip down to verse 12. It says, Jesus went into the temple. Then Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and who, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it to a den of thieves. Then verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They saw the miracles. They saw Jesus come to town. They heard what people were saying. They saw him lay hands and, uh, on the blind and on the lame and heal them. They saw the wonderful things he did. But what really got them 
What really ticked them off was when they heard the children crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. And it, the Bible says they were indignant. Other translations say they thought this was evil. And they said to him in verse 16, do you hear what these are saying? They fully expected Jesus to shut it down. Why? Because of what they were saying. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. That is a massive statement. That's huge. They are, in essence, and quite literally, calling him the Christ, the Messiah, the one who has come to save. And when the Pharisees heard this, they looked at Jesus and they're saying, are you hearing this? You better shut them up. You better shut this down. But did he? No. He said, yeah. And have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Do you see that up there? Perfected praise. We've been studying this quite a bit in our church lately. What it means to be perfected. And we have in our own vernacular and our use of the English language, we have an understanding of it. And I think it's our understanding of it in, in modern usage that keeps us from understanding what the Bible means when it uses the word perfected. We hear the word perfected or perfect and we think flawless. We think sinless. We think Jesus. And of course, he was and is perfect. But when you study the word perfect or perfected or perfecting in the scripture, it doesn't have to do with flawless. It doesn't have to do with never missing it, never making mistake. It has to do with maturity. It has to do with spiritual development. It has to do with growing up. And there are several words that are translated perfect or perfected, but no matter which one you're looking at, you will see one word come through every time, every time, and it's the word complete. That's what this word perfect means, complete. And this is what we've been talking about in our services as the Lord has led us, but in Colossians chapter 2, you see these words in verse 10, you are complete in him. You are complete in him. And what the verses around that are talking to us about in Colossians, the, the, the very verses before it say, beware. Beware lest anyone deceive you. Beware lest you, and these are my words, buy into something else. Lest you be deceived through philosophy or empty deceit or traditions of the world not according to Christ. He says, you're complete in him. What's he saying? Watch out for anything that tells you you are anything other than complete. And there's so much in this world that is feeding, feeding people this idea, you're not yet complete. You're not yet complete. And that's most of what marketing is built on. Oh, you know what you need. You're not yet complete. You're so close. If you just had this car, right? Oh, if you were just living in this house, if you just had this job making this money, then you'd be complete. Watch out. Beware. Beware of any thought, beware of any idea, beware of any notion that tells you you are anything other than complete because you are complete in him. That's where completion is found and that's the only place completion is found, complete in him. So when Jesus said out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise, he's saying this is perfectly complete. You cannot praise any better than what they're doing. That's an amazing thought to me. It's an amazing thought to me that you and I, and I know we, we miss it. I know the Bible says we stumble in all things. And yet, there is something that we can offer God that he would look at it, listen to it, receive it, and say, that was perfect. You could not have done that any better. That's an amazing thought. That you have something to give 
to the perfect one that he would call perfect. And it's your praise. We have the ability to offer perfect praise. Now, if you can offer perfect praise, guess what else you can offer? Imperfect, incomplete. And what's interesting to me as you study, like I said a moment ago, the the idea of perfect and perfecting, it really does have the idea of growing up. Do you remember when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, um, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is complete has come, then everything that's in part is going to be done away with. You know what the very next verse says in that chapter? When I was a child. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man... Notice this. He didn't say, I grew out of childish things. He said, I put them away. In other words, if there there are some things that if you don't put them away, you will stay a child forever. Ways of speaking, ways of thinking, ways of understanding. And this is really how we define where our children are. It's listening to their voice. There's just a way kids talk. If you, if you had little ones, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You remember when they were real little and they were first learning to talk. And the stuff they said, they messed it all up, didn't they? And it was so cute. The one that comes to my mind is when my, my little daughter said she wanted a hangaber. It, it, hamburger was a hard one for her, so it came out hangaber all the time. And I thought it was the cutest thing. And I never wanted her to stop saying hangaber. But let's be honest. What's cute when they're three is not as cute when they're 30, is it? There's a way that they speak when they're a child, but when they grow, how many know that we hope they stop talking the same way they talked when they were little? Stop thinking the same way they thought. Stop understanding the same way they understood. And that they grow up and develop. And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. You know it is the love chapter, and it is. It is the spiritual maturity chapter. Because when love is showing up, you're growing up. Love is the marker of spiritual maturity. When I was a child, I talked like one, thought like one, understood like one. But when I became a man, I put that stuff away. So perfecting, again, is about growing up. And yet, when it comes to praise, did you notice this? Jesus said, look at the children. Isn't that interesting? And there's plenty of scripture, Ephesians 4, that we need to grow up. We'd no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. Somebody say, grow up. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to grow up. Look at the other one and say, oh, grow up. We need to grow up. There is some growing to do. And yet Jesus here and in other places, tells us if you're not converted and like one of these little children, you're not even going to see the kingdom of heaven. So it's like, okay, well, which is it, Bible? Be a child, don't be a child. This is what we got to understand. The difference between childish and childlike. Childish, childlike. And when it comes to our praise, be childlike. He said they offered perfect praise. Isn't that amazing? You want to know how to praise God in a way that he receives it and he goes, perfect. That, that was awesome. And it's not even the way we do it with our children. When they're three and four years old and they've colored something, look what I did, daddy. And you look at, oh, it's perfect. Is it really though? I mean, they're outside the lines. It's a mess. When he says it's perfect praise, he really means is perfect praise. So if the children are the example and we want to follow that, then let's look at what they did. Let me go through a couple of these real quickly. I see three things, and maybe there's more, but this is what I see. In their praise that made it perfect. Let me kind of start from the bottom and work my way up here. One of the things you see that they did was they gave Jesus his place. Son of David. 
Hosanna to the son of David. They elevated him to the highest place. That's what perfect praise does. It exalts Jesus. It exalts the Father. Perfect praise exalts the Word. Perfect praise does not exalt emotion, does not exalt feeling, does not exalt personal experience. Perfect praise exalts Him. You know, we sing songs like from my childhood and before that, I exalt thee. You remember that one? I know you do. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I won't sing it. I, I want you to stay. But do you remember that one? I exalt thee, O Lord. You know, if you and I were to stand before the Lord right now and sing that and sing it from our heart, he'd, he'd receive that and go, that was perfect. Why? Because you're giving him his place. You're giving him his place. And if you, think it's, if you don't think it's a real temptation not to, read your Bible. This is where Satan lost it. As Lucifer, his God-ordained place was to exalt the Father. And we don't know how long he did that. He could have been doing that for eons and eons past. But when your place is to serve somebody else, here is what, here's the temptation you will face. It's the temptation to get tired of serving and want to be served. It's the temptation that we face that where we get tired of giving glory and we want to start getting some. Getting glory. And this is what Satan fell prey to. What Lucifer fell prey to. I will exalt my throne. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will be like the Most High God. What's he trying to do? Exalt himself. And this is what pride does. And you know what happened. He lost his place. But think about the polar opposite of that. You cannot get more opposite than Jesus. I have come down. Not gone up. I have come down. Not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. Amen. You cannot get more opposite than those two right there. And what Jesus showed us was perfect. That's it. That's what it is right there. Perfect. I will exalt the Father and I will be happy for now and all of eternity to give him his place. To give him his exaltation. Perfect praise simply gives Jesus his place. Perfect praise, if you look at the way the kids did it, was they used the Word of God. I think sometimes people think to be a really good praiser, you got to be a songwriter, you got to be a psalmist, you got to be a poet, or maybe you got to be a great speaker. You don't got to be any of that stuff. Use God's words. These are perfect words. And you have a book in this Bible called Psalms. It's a collection of what, over 150 psalms? And I want you to check out sometime how many of those psalms start like this. Praise the Lord. 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 You don't got to be a writer. All you got to be is a reader. Open the Bible. Find out what, what spirit-inspired praise looks like and sounds like and just start offering that. And what those children did when they were crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, son of David. They were literally quoting Psalm 118 that says, guess what? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's perfect praise. In other words, you don't have to use your own conjured up words. You don't got to. There's so many people that tell you to, you know, you got to identify with those feelings and, and out of those feelings, just be, I'm telling you today, church, be careful of those feelings. I know they're real, but why don't we stick with what the word of God said? And if we want to offer perfect praise, no matter what you're feeling, open this up and begin to read and begin to offer this up. And the Lord will receive it from you the very same way he received it from David. 
when you give him his place and use his words to praise him, you know what he says? Oh, that was perfect. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. This is the last one I want to spend just a couple of minutes on. Perfect praise gives Jesus his place. Perfect praise comes out of the word of God. But perfect praise, and this is the, probably the most simple um, facet of any of this. It's not praise until it comes out of your mouth. Did you notice Jesus said, out of their mouths, he has perfected praise? It's not praise until it's coming out of your mouth. And I know there are people that would want to fuss with you on that. And I see it. As somebody who stands, you know, behind a pulpit or on a platform in a service like this, I get a little bit of a different perspective than most everybody else in the room. And I've seen it Sunday after Sunday. I've seen it in churches all over the world where you got a worship leader, you got a band, you got somebody standing up there, praise the Lord, let's sing this together. They're singing, they're playing, and you got some that are joining in, and you got others that are just observers. Let me show you something. This is not praise. And there are many people that would say, well, I've got it in my heart. Uh, if it's not coming out of your mouth, chances are it's not in your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, what's going to happen? The mouth is going to speak. And it's not praise until it's coming out of your mouth. It's not praise until it is being expressed. Now, when Jesus said this to these, or to these Pharisees, he was quoting to them from the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter uh, 2, where he, it literally says this, Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have um, ordained strength, you have perfected praise. But that verse goes on to say, because of your enemy. Because of your enemy, you have perfected praise. And what he was saying there is it is praise that stills the enemy. It's praise that stops the avenger. Have you heard that before? Praise stills the enemy. It stops the enemy, the thief, the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You want to stop him? Let some praise come out of your mouth. Praise is part of your weaponry. Praise is part of your equipping. Praise is part of what you and I use to fight the enemy in this life. And if that's new information to you, you didn't know you had an enemy, you got one. I don't want that to rock you or shock you. You just need to know it. You have an enemy. But he doesn't just get to do whatever he wants to in your life. He's seeking those whom he may devour, which means there are those he may and those he may not. Can I see the hands of the may nots in this room today? Well, if you want to be a may not, guess what you're going to have to start doing? Letting some praise come up out of your mouth. Letting some praise not just be in the heart, not just be in the head. Get it out of your mouth because praise stills the enemy. But think about this. If praise stops him, what does complaining do? Hmm? If praise stops the enemy and opens the door of access for God to go to work in your life, what does unthankfulness do? What does complaining do? What does grumbling do? Huh? What does, ready, gossip do? What does backbiting and murmuring do? Huh? It enables the enemy and stops God. I've heard Brother Andrew minister on this so many times. Out of the book of Psalms. Talking about the children of Israel. Who in Egypt limited the Holy One. And they did it through their complaining. They failed to remember everything he had done for them. And they complained and they complained and they complained and they complained. Not knowing that it was literally tying the hands of God. 
And there's a bunch of people that don't, don't even think that's possible. They would tell you God is sovereign and he's going to do what he wants to do. And religion will tell you, well, we know God is able. We just don't know if he's willing. That's wrong. What you need to know is that God is willing. And what you need to find out is, is he able? Is he able to do it in my life? Or have I tied his hands with my complaining? Have I limited him with something coming out of my mouth other than praise? Because if praise stops the enemy, my complaining gets him stirred up. And this is one of the first places we need to look when sickness and disease has been a part of our lives for far too long and we're not seeing progress in that area. And I don't care if it's something physical, something financial, something relational, something emotional. If it's not going the way it needs to go, this is where you need to look right here. What's been coming out of your mouth? Look no further. Find out what's been coming out of your mouth. Perfect praise is praise that gives Jesus his place. Perfect praise is praise that uses his word to magnify him. And perfect praise is the sound of thanksgiving coming out of your mouth. Now look at this. This is the last scripture we'll look at in the book of James. James chapter 3. Some of this is really fresh to me. We've just been going over this in our church recently, and I'm telling you, the Lord is helping us so much. But in James chapter 3, you're familiar most likely with this passage He says in verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Verse 2, For we all stumble in many things. I mentioned that to you a moment ago. And here we, we see the scripture acknowledge that. We all stumble in many things. And I know the temptation. When it seems like you're missing it in every area. And it seems like, man, no matter what I'm doing, I'm stumbling. I'm stumbling financially. I'm stumbling in my marriage. I'm stumbling on the job. I'm stumbling in school. I'm missing it over and over and over again. If you meditate on all the places you're missing it in, it's going to get depressing real quick. It's going to get really heavy. You're going to get very discouraged. And the, but that's the temptation to look at all the places I'm missing it. And you start beating yourself up because I'm missing it here and I'm missing it there. Not getting it right. But notice what he says. In, this, in, in the next part of this verse, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. He's a grown up. He is complete. If... He doesn't stumble in his words. So here's what I'm seeing in this. Instead of getting so depressed over all the areas you're missing it in, let's focus on what's coming out of our mouth. Because what he goes on to say in this same verse, he's a perfect man, also or able also to bridle the whole body. Are you kidding me right now? I can fix all these areas I'm missing it in If I'll focus on what's coming out of my mouth, I can bridle the whole body. I can get a handle on the finances. I can get a handle on the marriage. I can get a handle on my relationship with my kids. I can get a handle on what's going on at work, what's going on at home, what's going on at school. If I'll watch what's coming out of my mouth. If I can bridle this. And then, of course, you know the picture he paints here. He said, we put put bits in horses' mouths. Because we won't be able to tell them which way to go. And then he starts talking about ships, giant boats. And he says, great big ships are controlled with a little rudder. And that, here's what I'm seeing, is that ship does not get to make up its mind where it goes. That little rudder tells that ship what direction to go in. Anybody interested in turning the ship around? Hmm? Anybody interested in getting this thing going in the right direction? Well, I grew up in a house and around a ministry where this was a big deal. I'm telling you, the words of our mouths were a big deal to us. 
Mimi and Papa preached on this, and it wasn't just from the platform. It was in the living room, man. We watched what we said. We watched our confession. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you what it was like growing up in this house. Sixth grade, when it came time for science experiments, this was my science experiment. I took two plants, two identical plants, fed them the same amount of water, gave them the same amount of sunlight, but I wrote a positive confession over one and a negative confession over the other. This is how we do science in the house of faith. And to one plant, I said, you are healthy, you are strong, you are growing, you are vibrant, you are God's creation. To the other plant, I said, you are weak, you are dying, nobody loves you, nobody wants you. And that's a whole long story, but, you know, as we're getting close to the end here and I'm not seeing the results I want to see, I'm crying to mom about it one day and I'm going, it's not working, it's not working. And she goes, yes, it is. And I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. She says, yes, it is. No, it's not working. It's not working. Jeremy, yes, it is working. And she said it was like a light bulb came on above my head. Oh, you're confessing it's working. And from that point to the end of that project, one plant began to grow strong. The other plant began to wither and fade away. And I got the blue ribbon to prove it. But the rest of the story is, after the science project, mom kept the plants. Somehow they ended up on some shelf behind books or something. And she completely forgot about them for, I don't know what it was, six weeks or months later. Came across them, had not fed them, had not watered them. They had no sunlight. One was dead and gone. One was still alive. Living on the faith-filled words of a sixth grader. You want to turn the ship around? Start right here. Now, we've always, I think, or I have anyway, understood that to mean, okay, so watch your words, right? Don't, don't identify like we were talking about earlier. I, I'm, not, I'm not the sick. I'm not confessing sickness over me. I'm going to confess the word of God over me. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'm redeemed from the curse. Christ was made a curse for me, for it's written, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. This is my childhood, by the way, right here. And just <laughs> confessing the word of God, confessing the word of God. And this is good. This is right. But if you keep reading this in the book of James, you find out that he's not specifically or necessarily just talking about the confession you make about your healing or the confession you make about your prosperity or the confession you make specifically about something else. What he says here in James chapter 3 in verse 10, or excuse me, back up verse Eight, he said, no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who've been made in the similitude of our God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. These are the two things. Blessing God, cursing other people. These right here are determining which direction your boat's going in. When you are using your mouth to bless God, to offer perfect praise, your boat makes that turn, starts heading in the direction God's called you in, created you to go in, to the place He's got great things for you. But the moment we start using that same mouth to grumble, complain, curse others, backbite, gossip, guess what happens to that boat? It does a 180 out there on the sea. And it starts heading in the other direction. And when I started seeing this, I, I, I just couldn't help but picture these boats of Christians out there in the middle of the ocean doing this. These boats that are just doing this all the time. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Praise you. I'll tell you what, I don't like that guy at all. I'm telling you, what a jerk. No, no, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Never making any progress. You want to get this boat headed in the right direction? Offer perfect praise. Amen. And my wife says it like this all the time. If you will spend all your time blessing, you will never have time for cursing. Amen. Never. And we're going to have to come to the place, family, especially those among us who are dealing with sickness and disease or something that's been a part of our lives for a long time. You have got to come to the place where you will not tolerate gossip, you will not tolerate somebody cursing somebody else towards you or, or using you to talk bad about other people. 
You, can't, you don't have time for that. You have no time for that. You've got no time to entertain complaining. And if you want to know how serious this stuff is, go back and read your Old Testament sometime. They, they talked about the children of Israel before they entered the promised land and Aaron and Miriam and how they would, they, uh, 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 Miriam went into Aaron's tent and began to complain about Moses. And guess who heard it? God, Jehovah God heard it. And he came down and he said, you three, come here. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. And the Lord said, I heard what you said about me. No, 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 I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about Moses. No, no, no. I heard what you said about me. So we have a rule. In our house, on our staff, at our church, we don't vent in the tent. I said, we don't vent in the tent. In other words, your tent, your home, your life, your space should not be a safe place for somebody just to come vent. Hmm. Why? I don't have time for that. First of all, my ears are not your trash can. I, I don't have time for that. I, I, I need the blessing of the Lord. I need to be getting stronger, not weaker. Hmm? I need to be getting richer, not poorer. I, don't, I do not let, let me stop you right there. And what happened that day was that Miriam got leprosy. Moses pleaded for, the Lord was merciful, but I guarantee you this, when somebody came to Miriam's tent and knocked after that and said, hey, can I come in? She said, sure. And they said, hey, can I, I just need to talk to you for a second. Yeah, what's going on? It's about Moses. No, no, no. Get out of this tent. I'm not listening to that. You go complain to somebody else. This is a no vent tent. No venting in this tent. You know, when you experience something like that, you recognize, I don't have any time for this in my life. The only thing coming out of my mouth is blessing, blessing, blessing. Bless you, Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Is that, is that praising or complaining? When you're complaining, are you remembering the benefits of the Lord? Not a one. When you're blessing, here come all the benefits. What are those benefits? who has forgiven all your iniquities, who has healed all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. As long as this is coming out of my mouth, guess what's not coming out? I don't care. I don't I'm a jerk. I don't, I, she doesn't love me. They don't want me. You just turned the boat in the wrong direction. Is this making sense to you? Why don't we stand up together? We got about 45 seconds. Why don't we just fill our mouths with praise for about the next 40 seconds or so? Can we do it? Lift up praise right now. Father, we bless you. We worship you and honor you. Lord Jesus, we exalt you to your high place. Heavenly Father, we exalt you and your name above every other name that is named. We bow our knee to the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are the Son of David, the Christ, the Messiah. And we honor you. We praise you and magnify you. Thank you so much for what you did in your death, your burial, your resurrection, your ascension. Thank you for ever living to make intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. We thank you. We praise you. And we bless each other. We choose to bless one another. No more complaining coming out of our mouth. Say this out loud. Set a watch. Say it again. Set a watch over my mouth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, set a guard, set a guard over, my over my lips. My tent, my tent is a no vent tent. <laughs> no, vent. No, complaining. no complaining, no grumbling. No grumbling. Not, against Not against the Father. Not against my leaders. Not against, Not against my spouse. Not against, Not against my coworkers. Not, Not against my family. I don't use my tongue for that. I use my mouth. To bless the Lord, to bless the Lord, to offer perfect praise in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Come on, just honor Him, praise Him.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Daniel, I'll turn this back over to you, sir. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jeremy. Wow, what a great word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just lift our hands again. Just bless the Lord. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for becoming the curse for us. Thank you that it was by your stripes, the stripes that were laid on you. You're the one that paid the price for us to be able to be healed today. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Prayer ministers, would you come and get into position? And those of you who are believing God today would, would like someone to lay hands on you. We want to invite you to uh, take this moment to receive. You know, you could receive next week. You could receive next month. But why don't you decide to receive today what Jesus paid for with his very life? And you know, when I was thinking about that one day, this is what I heard. God paid for you with his blood, and he wants what he paid for. Come on, somebody. He wants what he paid for. What he paid for is for you to be living life and be living it abundantly. Amen? For you to be living disease and sickness free. Hallelujah. And not medicating it, not trying to manage it. Jesus came to take it away. And because he did, we can have that victory and that overcoming life even right now. Amen? So if you're ready to receive, come on down. Let, come down to the aisles. Let our ushers help direct you to our prayer ministers. We're going to be here as long as we need to be here. And as you're coming, again, I want to just say a special thank you to Jeremy for uh, taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. What a great, great word. Amen? And those of you on the internet, we have prayer ministers who are standing by even right now. No matter what time zone you are in, our prayer center is open now 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you'll call that number on your screen, 719-635-1111, you'll be able to have a prayer minister pray with you. And I'm telling you, we are seeing miracles and breakthroughs every day. So don't wait, you know, do it now. Because God wants his best in your life even right now. And as you experience this healing and recovery and breakthrough in your life, we know it's by the blood of the lamb that we overcome. But it's also the word of our testimony. So again, just what Jeremy was saying, what is coming out of our mouth? We would love to hear from you about what God has done for you today. Because not only will it be a blessing to you, it's going to bless a whole lot of other people around the world. So please write us. Please call us. Let us know how the Healing School has been a blessing to you. So again, those of you who are uh, here in this auditorium.